Welcome to our review on DNA structure and the scientists involved in its discovery. So first thing we actually need to remember then is the actual structure of a general animal cell. So this is something you would have looked at all the way back in year seven, but it's good to go over it to make sure that you can identify all of those parts. So first of all, around the very outside, we've got the cell membrane. It's always a membrane, never a cell wall. Okay, animal cells do not have a cell wall. Inside that, we've got the cytoplasm, which is kind of like the jelly-like substance that's contained within the cell membrane. That dark spot, the large one in the center there, is the nucleus. Now, it doesn't have to be in the center, but the largest dark spot in there will be the nucleus. And then around there, we've got these smaller little dots, which are the mitochondria. So the other thing we need to know then is what each of these organelles actually does. So when we're actually answering that question, we need to make sure we use specific terms. For the nucleus, we've got to say that it controls the cell. You cannot say that it's the brain of the cell, okay? That will get you no marks. You must say that it controls the cell, and you can also say that it contains DNA or genetic information. Cell membrane is our second one, and that literally controls what can enter and leave the cell. It's kind of like a gateway, if you like, deciding what can go in or out of the cell at any given time. The cytoplasm is where the chemical reactions are going to take place. And finally, the mitochondria then is the site of aerobic respiration. Now we come on to think a little bit more about DNA itself. Now, first thing to remember is when we're talking about DNA, we're talking about the thing that codes for the proteins. Now, proteins are very important to living things because we use them for growth, for repair, and for building cells. The DNA itself then is made from three important parts. The first one is the ribose sugar, second one is a phosphate group, and finally it's made up of four bases. Now you don't need to remember the full names for these, purely just the letters. So that's A, T, C and G. So you've got to make sure you remember those four letters for the bases, A, T, C and G. Now what we actually find is, as you can see in the diagram on the left there, that these bases pair up in a very specific manner called complementary base pairing. So A will always pair with T and C always pairs with G. Easiest way to remember is A and T are both kind of pointy letters, they go together, and C and G are more rounded letters and they always go together. Now, when we think about humans, what we need to remember then is that inside a normal body cell, then humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. So that's 46 individuals or 23 pairs. Now, different organisms will have different numbers. So do go carefully if they ask you questions about how many chromosomes would you find in particular cells, that you make sure you read the information in the question, because sometimes it won't be about humans. Now, what we actually find then when we look at that DNA is that we can actually split it up into these shorter sections called genes. Now, these genes are going to code for a particular protein. So what we then find is that all of those base pairs we looked at previously, the sequence that they occur in, in that gene, then gives us the code for one particular protein. By changing the sequence of base pairs, we change the code, so we change the protein we make. Now, if you think back to what we said about the nucleus controlling the cell, the reason it does so is because inside our nucleus, we've got the DNA. The DNA splits into genes which code for proteins, and one example of the proteins that are coded for are enzymes. So what we actually find then is that your genetic code actually controls how enzymes are made in cells. Now, when we look at these chemical reactions that occur in all aspects of cellular life, then the vast majority are actually controlled by enzymes. So what we find then is because our genetic code controls how the enzymes are made and enzymes control the chemical reactions, the genetic co code controls all cell activity. Now, when we're thinking about a whole living organism, it wouldn't be very useful for every single cell to make every single protein. It'd be kind of a waste of energy and also it'd mean that we wouldn't have that specialization. So what we actually find is that in these more complex organisms that are made up of more than one type of cell, then different cells have different genes switched on. So what that means is that if a gene is switched on, 
then it will make that protein. Whereas if the gene is switched off, it won't make that protein. So in each individual cell, so a red blood cell, for example, that would only have certain genes switched on, like the one to make hemoglobin. Whereas you wouldn't find the actual gene for hemoglobin being switched on in, say, a liver cell. So what we actually have there is a way of actually determining the function of a cell purely by switching on or off different genes. So the big question then, who actually discovered all of this stuff? And the answer is, it's not just one person. What we find here is a brilliant example of how many different scientists work together to actually come up with the final solution, if you like. So you do need to remember these different scientists and how they actually contributed to the discovery of DNA. First one then is we've got these two scientists, Rosalind Franklin and Morris Wilkins. And what they were actually doing in the 1950s was they were using what's called X-ray crystallography to have a look at the structure of DNA. So basically they were using X-rays to take pictures of the structure of DNA. Now, what that actually led to was Franklin producing an X-ray photograph of the structure there. Now, what Franklin didn't know was that Wilkins, who was obviously working with her, had given these other two scientists, James Watson and Francis Crick, the image that she'd produced. Now, what Watson and Crick were able to do with that image and with the work they'd been doing was that they actually worked out the three-dimensional structure of the DNA. And that's what's known as the double helix that we're so familiar with today. So what we actually found then was as a result of this work, then Crick, Watson and Wilkins all received the Nobel Prize in 1962. The reason that Franklin didn't get that Nobel Prize was because she'd actually died four years earlier and it wasn't until much later that her work in producing that X-ray image was actually credited. One thing to remember, no matter what we're talking about in scientific discovery, then there's always going to be that delay between the actual discovery itself and its actual importance being recognised or actually rewarded in the scientific community. Now, the reason for that is twofold, really. Firstly, they need to actually verify the work. It's all good and well someone saying, oh, yeah, I've just discovered this. But if other scientists can't replicate your findings or verify your findings, then it won't ever be accepted. So that's one delay. And the second thing is that sometimes the things that you actually discover, their importance isn't always immediately clear. So what we find is that some scientists would have done some work, they'd have published their papers and everyone gone, yeah, yeah, that's fine. But because they didn't then realise what that then led to and the importance of that one little discovery that they made, then they're not recognised at the time. But later on, after other people have done more work, they look back and think, well, without this person's work, we couldn't have got here. 